So um, um, I'm assuming at least some people will be familiar with this, but never mind. Um, yeah, so the scene, um, <coughs> episode five of Doctor Who and the Daemons, the, the Brigadier finally arrives in the village <coughs> of uh, Devil's End and uh, comes up with the immortal lines, as in here. Jenkins, jump with the wings, five rounds left it. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Um, I mean, see, if you haven't seen this, there are spoilers in this talk. <laughs> <laughs> to it, for one thing, the St. Michael's Church in Aldbourne, as shown in the top image, ends up blowing up at the end of the story. It, it's said that people contacted the BBC after this was first broadcast, um, <coughs> saying how terrible it was that the BBC had blown up this church. <laughs> That's my photograph, because I've been to Walborn a couple of times to check out the locations associated. Um, what's quite interesting about this particular Doctor Who story is that it actually uses this prehistoric site, a group of four barrows, Walborn four barrows. It's about <coughs> half a mile, mile outside the village. Um, in the story, there's an alien spaceship. In, um, and more spoilers inside on the barrows. As far as I can work out, if you look at the picture at the top, and um, one of the wikis on Doctor Who says this as well, it's uh, all born number three, which in my photograph at the bottom is the one on the right. So the photograph at the top is taken looking from all born four towards all born three. Bear that top picture in mind though, because you'll see something interesting later on. That, well, I think it's interesting. Okay, so um, <laughs> there's a wonderful character called Professor Horner who comes out of this six inches behind. He's got a wonderful, I uh, think, kind of Yorkshire accent. Six inches behind this, here lies the greatest archaeological finds in this country since Sudden Ulat. <laughs> Unfortunately, he gets frozen to death. Um, <laughs> And uh, as part of the uh, narrative on, on a channel which is actually called BBC Three, which is quite well, you know, BBC Three has come and gone, but it was quite prophetic for 1973, I think the series was on. But it also mentions several previous attempts to excavate this barrow, including the Cambridge University fiasco. I was going to say, is there anybody here from Cambridge? If they could enlighten us about this, I'd really like to know. Um, now Barry Letts, who, who I think he actually wrote it under a pseudonym because he was the producer, but he, he mentions a number of different sources that he drew on for the ideas that went into the Daemons. One of which was uh, Wheatley's The Devil Rides Out and all that sort of black magic literature that was coming out in the 50s and 60s. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but <coughs> there are two verses of Quatermass in the pit. One the original TV series, and then it was remade by Hammer as a feature film, where they've, that's it, 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 it's the extension of a London Underground line where they find the remains of an alien spacecraft. It did tend me to wonder what they might have found during Crossrail. But, um, <laughs> so that was another of his inspirations. Um, another one, and thinking back to that picture before, can you see the, the similarities? This was the BBC's sponsored excavation of Silbury Hill, which was, I think, between about 69 and 71, which he also took as one of his inspirations. I, I think, kind of visually, there's some really, when I found this picture, I thought, bloody hell, that was just on the Doctor Who. Oh, I should also say, I think he also drew, nicked a few ideas from the Midwich Cookers as well, because, again, if you know the series, um, the alien being puts up this kind of dome over the village to stop people getting in the now, which is exactly what happens in the village cookies. Now to my mind, you know, sci-fi and archaeology have a, actually a very long history of being connected with each other. In terms of Doctor Who, um, another classic one where a Pacific archaeological site is a key part in the story is the Stones of Blood. It's, um, it's, um, Tom Baker story, where they used the roll right stones. I think they added a few of their own stones, <laughs> as far as I remember. It's all right. It's not as good as poetry, but it's a matter of taste. Um, 
But going right back, there's a wonderful French book called Les Ruines de Paris, published in 1975. And essentially, it, it's kind of satirical. It, it's, it's set in a remote future where archaeologists from um, New Caledonia come and explore the ruins of Paris in what we're talking about, the 5th millennium AD. Um, and I say that it was one of the first of a whole slew of stories, and you get this, like you get a lot of early sci-fi comes out of invasion literature, starting with the, uh, what's it, the Battle of Dorking, and then there are dozens, if not hundreds of stories that have come across, you know, not just in the UK, but right across Europe, Japan, blah, 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 blah. Same thing with these sort of stories. Often it seems to be New Zealanders. This is a classic one, uh, which Michael Walcott reprinted in Before I'm Again, where some people from New Zealand come and, and gawp at the ruins of London and puzzle over what they could possibly mean. So this is a really big thing between sort of like the 1880s and the first decade of the 20th century. Um, so in a sense, the, the relationship between archaeology and science fiction has been there since the were archaeology or science fiction. Um, that same trope, of course, then is taken up in the late 70s by, but I don't know if you've come across it called The Motel of the Mysteries by David McCauley, which you know, it takes exactly the same kind of satirical line, of, but, but, but this case taking a, what is now or was then a modern context to a motel in a post-nuclear context. And, having people puzzle over what these bizarre artefacts mean and what the shower cap was all about. Um, now, I mean, you know, through, through the kind of new wave, they're, they're, I mean, these are just some ones that I happen to quite like, um, all of which in one way or another have archaeological sites. Mostly, they tend to be, what I would say would be kind of xeno-archaeological sites, i.e. they're archaeological sites on alien planets, unlike, say, the Doctor Who and some others, which we can think of, which are on Earth. Occasionally, they're archaeological sites associated with human um, settlements on other planets, but you see what I mean? Th there's this long-running relationship, and, um, you know, you can read off dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of books in which um, archaeology comes into science fiction. Um, from the people who didn't come, we're going to talk about this Alistair Reynolds book, which, I mean, the whole premise of the novel, again, is, is built around excavating and trying to understand this alien culture, all the dreadful things that, of course, a more recent book, uh, excellent little book by Becky Chambers, which is not really about archaeology, but again, in passing, it mentions archaeological material on another planet. And, um, Doc already talked about Picard, in fact, I think you used the same, <laughs> the same image as I did, Picard's amateur archaeology. Um, but there's some other classic ones, I mean, Forbidden Planet, the film from 1959. Um, this is a, one of the few stories I could find of the, um, the buried um, technology of this people called the Krell, which causes all sorts of trouble in what is essentially a kind of remake of. Um, the Tempest, but but with a science fiction. Um, the Total Recall I'm talking about is this, this Schwarzenegger one, where of course they find this alien technology buried in Mars, which can revivify the atmosphere of the planet. It's a trope that recurs ever and again. Now, to my mind, I must say, um, archaeology and science fiction. Uh, in kind of a mirror relationship with each other. And what I mean by that is that both start from the present, both in one way or another, take evidence from the present, but one projects it back and the other projects it forward. Um, sometimes they choose a different selection of artefacts, but a lot of the time they're starting from the artefactual evidence of the present and trying to extrapolate. Um, as I said, a lot of the time, but not exclusively, the science fiction stuff tends to be seen or archaeological, and when it is in relation to terrestrial, it tends to be about kind of alien interventions, as in 2001 here, 
or indeed in, in the Doctor Who and the Damons where again a kind of well you know it's this recurring idea that um, humans couldn't have invented um, bottled water without the intervention of people from another planet um, Wells wrote this really great essay which I thoroughly recommend it's not fiction it's, it's a a lecture he gave in, I think, about 1905. Um, but, uh, uh, my own view is that the future was invented rather than discovered, but uh, it's just a quibble. Um, and quite makes, certainly at that time, was that you know most people would believe that the past was knowable, but most people believed that the future wasn't knowable. Now, Part of what I was talking about, I mean, bear in mind, you know, he was a student of Huxley and had studied geology and all this sort of stuff, was that the new knowledge of geology and evolution and everything meant that we could scientifically project back into the past and start to undermine essentially the knowledge which people thought they had, which was up to that point based purely upon memory and what was written down, and actually kind of get hard evidence to understand what quote unquote really happened in the past. The slide at the bottom is cheating actually because it's not real stratigraphy, it's, um, it's from uh, Park and Crystal Palace and it's a fake reconstruction of coal measures, but I just thought it would be for a laugh. Um, and it's quite cool. But So what Wells says is, oh, I, I should say that there is this saying which apparently originates in Denmark and I've been trying to verify this for a while but I haven't succeeded yet. Wells doesn't think this. He thinks he can and this is what he says. In other words, it, it, his point is that if you can use science to project our knowledge back into the past then you should be able to use a similar sort of principle to project our knowledge into the future and he, this is his quote. Well, just to test it out, I did a little bit of an experiment, which is <laughs> some of these slides. <laughs> now, I think it's fair to say that, you know, they're not all identical, and it, to some extent, he's not quite right. But on the other hand, I think it was a useful experiment in the sense that, basically, he kind of got it right. The basic shape of that pile of sand that I poured out onto a piece of paper, I did it about 15 times. But they're all basically the same, and that's his point. That, that we may not be able to see the detail of what's going to happen in the future, but we can at least kind of get an idea and know what a general pattern might be. And the obvious example of that is in predicting climate change, uh, where you know we don't know whether it's going to be vines growing in Orkney or or deserts in Huddersfield or whatever it is but we do know quite a bit about what is likely to happen maybe not in that detail of the individual grains or the exact shape of the heap but at least roughly what it's going to be so in a sense the way, the way I think I see it is that archaeologists looking backwards have the grains of sand but they don't know the shape of the heap and science fiction writers and those who are interested in the future have got some idea of the shape of the heap but they have no idea about what happens to the individual grains of sand those are grains of sand by the way I don't know they're really nice um, now I mean another thing that links our theology and science fiction to my mind is, is this thing of presentism I, a number of people mentioned this previously already uh, George Stocking is supposedly the kind of uh, source for talking about the role of presentism and, you know, kind of trying to counteract that sort of weak history. And I guess you say that people like Foucault and Kuhn and what have you are examples of trying to break from that notion. Um, and I don't think so. I'm ahead of myself. Uh, in archaeology, obviously, we're familiar with this. Other people have already mentioned it, and you know, the same goes for um, 
science fiction. It's one of the kind of perennial things that people say, oh, well, of course, science fiction is just about present, it's not really about future. Well, yes, up to a point, Bill Copper, that's true. I mean, clearly when Orwell was writing 1984, he was writing about 1948. There's no doubt about that. I mean, he wasn't a sci-fi writer anyway. And when Franklin was writing in the 1870s, what he was doing was satirising prison society in 1875. He wasn't writing about the fifth millennium. But when you read something like these two novels by Stanislaus Lem, obviously Solaris been made into movies twice. The other one, not, I don't think. But they both address similar issues. And those issues are about trying to communicate with and understand other beings on other planets and essentially failing because <laughs> it's just too difficult. It's that extreme of cognitive estrangement that you mentioned earlier from uh, a man whose name I've just forgotten, <laughs> soothing, darko soothing. Um, and in these books I mentioned earlier, th they're often dealing with this kind of notion of an estrangement where it really isn't possible to entirely get to grips with whatever it is that these alien people were doing or thinking, um, even by digging up their remains. They, they, rem they remain kind of evasive and difficult to, to make sense of, which, you know, is not really about the present. It's, well, I mean, I suppose you might <laughs> possibly the ethnographic present, but not more generally. A, a lot of science fiction is about trying to think about things outside of any sort of present context. Um, the other aspect of presentism, of course, is the fact that any science fiction um, written at any time is kind of limited by the technology that's available. Um, <coughs> somebody mentioned Gibson earlier on. Gibson himself um, quite openly admits that his big cock-up in writing the, new, the um, sprawl series of novels, which begins in Euromancer, is that nobody has a mobile phone. Because when he wrote it in the, uh, 1983 or 82, it just simply didn't occur to him that mobile phones were going to be such a kind of <coughs> predominant part of, of society in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, the irony is, of course, that <laughs> this, uh, no, this particular mobile phone, which was the first clamshell phone um, produced by Motorola, the StarTac, StarTac, see the clue in the <laughs> name, is said to have been based on the communicator from the TOS. And I actually tried to contact the guy who designed the StarTac, but he didn't bother to reply. <laughs> so, so I've yet to find out and verify whether this is true. But I think there's, there's plenty of... Well, I mean, you just got to bloody look at it and think about the name, and it's a bit of a giveaway, isn't it? So despite that, you know, um, <laughs> uh, Gibson doesn't think of people having mobile phones in the future. Um, in a sense, the point is that, um, you know, when you're looking at the future, you're not seeing the grains of sand, the, the, the phones, the, the details. You're not seeing the fact that, you know, it, I, I chose this because it was fun, but, you know, if you look at the, the, the bridge of the Enterprise and the TOS, the, the screens are all really kind of clunky, sort of CRT, and, and you'll get this in so many um, science fiction things until, you know, until we've got flat screens, and you know, it'll be flat screens in sci-fi until we get something else. And, and, and it'll all look dated in 10 years. Because you can't see the grain, you can't see the, the fine grain, you can only ever see the, the heap. Um, my conclusions, such as they are, the, the importance of cognitive estrangement science. I mean, I, <laughs> I started trying to write about science fiction and archaeology um, after the, the whack in Dublin in 2008. And ended up writing about estrangement instead because I thought it was. Yeah, I just put it into going off into that. But it is 
one of the key things that both disciplines, if they can be called that, share, and something that we constantly need to keep in mind, the, the fact that, as I once said, um, to, to try and treat the familiar as unfamiliar. And, and I, the fact that archaeology and science fiction are kind of mirror images of each other, for me, creates a potential for what, what um, Adorno calls a negative dialectic. They can rub up against each other and create a, a kind of dialectical friction that actually could be quite productive. And finally, through uh, to Boldy Go. Thank you very much.